Okay, this one I've been looking forward to for a while. Mr. Randy Blockett. Thank you for coming out, man. This is um we're still here. Uh had a couple visits with Bass Pro Shops and and things this week and uh thank you for carving out a little bit of time and sitting down with us. How far do you live from where we're at right now? We're at the tail race of Table Rock Lake mm-hmm. and this is that this is where Lake Taney Como starts. But how far do you live from here? I'm just straight up Highway 65 about 30 miles, so it's not bad at all. Not too bad. Yeah, I okay. can be I can Launched there at Indian Point, probably about 35 minutes from my house. So it's really nice. Nice. Yeah, this is such a cool area. If you've never been in this area, I highly recommend you guys yeah, checking this out. I'm looking out the window right now. It's just absolutely gorgeous. And, uh, yeah, so, you know, normally we see you. A lot of our, our viewers watch a lot of your stuff and, and everything. And we normally see you through a lens of a camera. Mm-hmm. You're uploading daily, right? I mean, on multiple, your channel? Multiple 20, times. Wow. 22 videos. I got three YouTube channels now, so I got like 22 videos a week. Are you I've kidding me? What sort of engagement do you get? Like, can you say? As far as like watch time views, or viewers? Yeah, watch time. Um, oh, like, what's your average watch time a month or a week? Do you the, know? the watch time on my three channels totals about 1.5 million or 1.5 million views per month. Wow. That's and amazing. watch time is about... Oh, 60,000. That's really like that. strong. That That's good. hard work, dude, because when we started this podcast, what, a year and a half ago, I think you're the 26th guest or so, and it's slow. We're learning a lot along the way, but that is hard work. Well, for, first of all, congratulations. <laughs> when you guys started this, I, I remember it's like, man, there's so many dang podcasts. I was, I didn't really know how it would go. Mm-hmm. Right. You guys are killing it, man. Thanks. You guys are Thank absolutely you. killing yeah. us as far as the... You know, to, to get somebody to watch something for an hour and a half, as many views as you guys get, yeah, that is impressive. It is. We definitely knew there were a lot out there. We did not want to come in and just be another one. Like, when we talked about it and talked with companies, we were, we were like, we got to add value or there's no point in doing this. And so then that was the next step. Like, the question, like, how do we even do a podcast that's mm-hmm. not being done? And it was more doing things in person. Mm-hmm. Which is hard, you know, you're not in person with people 12 mm-hmm. months out of the year. Yeah. So, and and then finding quality guests who want to talk, mm-hmm. that's hard. Most fishermen are closed off. Mm-hmm. They'll tell you one thing when cameras are down. And then when <laughs> cameras are on, it's like the most product pushy, perfect, everything's positive, you know. Yeah. And so um, it's taken some time to navigate and we don't get a podcast every week, but it's just our model, you know, like we'll wait for the right guests, right. you know, and if we can't get that, there's no point in just having a podcast to have a podcast. Do you feel like right now, so here we are in the off season and we're in between the 2023 20, season, 2024 tournament season. Do you feel like kind of this off season, there's like, a, it just seems like podcast hosts and let's say fishing personalities are just one big circle of like interviews, you know, like <laughs> My goal here today is to talk about things that we haven't talked about over the last couple of months, you know, and that's kind of hard to do because there's been so much put out there. I mean, in the last week, how many podcasts have you been on? Or two weeks, how, how many podcasts have you been on? Uh, four in the last two wow. weeks, I guess. So it's been sort of a rash of them here lately. Yeah. Do you feel like, <laughs> what? I mean, you've been in the fishing industry for how long now? The 85, 86 season was my first year with Bassmaster. Wow. That's, she was back, born in 86. I know. No, I was born in 87. 87. Yeah. Well, back then, Bassmaster, the season was split. They had the first half of the season in the fall. So I, I started the 85 season, and then the second half was the 86 season. So that was the first year. Do you feel like since 1986 that in 2023 you were the most relevant in the sport of bass fishing than you've ever, ever been? Oh, without a doubt, yeah. the YouTube. You yeah. Know, you just, you can't compete with it. I, I could have won the Bassmaster Classic two or three times in a row and you still don't get, you know, the amount of attention or impression generations you do with YouTube. It's and there are a couple. completely changed the industry. There are. We have a couple of back to back, you know, classic winners out there that don't get the attention. Yeah. Just like you said. I mean, that's, that's proof. I mean, right there. They're both hard work. It's hard work to win the classic once, but to do it back to back like a couple of our guys mm-hmm. have. Um, yes, that's hard work, but the stuff you're doing, pumping out content every single day, I mean, that is equally as tough. Yeah, it is. It's, but me, it's like, I got 50 years to draw on it, you know, so I've got so much reference I can go back over Mm -hmm. and it's, uh, it's been, it's, it's really been a perfect segue for me coming in, coming from a professional angler for so many years into like the second phase of my career. Cause 
you know, I like I said, my day in the sun's over as a tournament angler. I love fishing tournaments mm-hmm. out there, but the the reality of is when you get fifty years old, something clicks and you just you can't compete. And I don't understand it why you just can't compete like you were when you were earlier. Because I remember having a a conversation with Klein quite a few years ago, and this was the time when. Rick was starting, instead of getting in the top 10 in the Angler of the Year, he was starting to barely qualify for the Classic. You know, he'd be in the 20s or something. I go, how is it that these young guys are coming in and beating you in Angler of the Year, and you've got so much experience? And at the time, he couldn't, he didn't understand it. I could tell he was sort of struggling with it as well. But we've seen the reason why. I mean, it's like, you know, imagination and creativity yeah. trumps experience. It does, for sure. It's, it's not a physical thing. It's, it's not, not. It's not a physical it's thing, or else. maybe a small part of physical thing, but it's mental. It's all upstairs. It's so hard when, like, on, with Klein or anybody like that, or you know, Fritz with a crankbait. You get so locked in the success you've had in a certain genre that it's very difficult to, you know, leave that behind and start something new. It's just the process, the aging process. Boy, that scares me to hear because here I am, thirty nine years old, and like the swim bait is my bread and butter. But uh, yeah, I mean, if I don't you know, stray away from that sooner in some of these tournaments. I mean, I got to be careful. Well, when you're young, you have to, you don't have anything, right? You have a a fresh slate. So you're creating that genre for Mm -hmm. yourself and what defines you. Right. But then when you get older, you've already got that part defined. Mm -hmm. So that does make sense. I've never thought about it like that. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, another thing is like your energies get spilled out because you, in order, when you're at the top of your game as a tournament angler, you don't have any other focus. It's like right. you live, eat, and breathe it. But as you get older, like, you know, you guys now, you've got the business with the podcast mm-hmm. and everything. You've got a lot of different irons in the fire. And that energy, you know, starts to dissipate a little bit. And you cannot mm-hmm. maintain yeah. that level of performance unless you're all in with it. And, that, and that there's, it's not, that's not a bad thing. That's just the natural progression. Of it, it is. I, I got to tell you, I, to be honest, I kind of envy those one-year and two-year guys. who I could see it in their eyes. Dude, they're so hungry. But they don't have like all these obligations with these sponsors mm. that you cu- accumulate thirteen yeah. years doing it, twenty five, thirty years doing it, or or whatever it is. And that's, I'm I'm a little envious of that. It's kind of like, uh, you know, it's it's just it's it's dumbed down for some of those guys. I I feel like to where they could only focus on one thing, and that's just catching five bass a day in these tournaments. And I remember those days. Yeah, we haven't we've been in the Ozarks this whole week, and we have been all three of us uh, working from the moment we wake up till like at night. I mean, every night's ended at what? 9 PM, 8 30 PM. That's, when we, that's yeah. That's late for us. Yeah. Which <laughs> is late for us for early. We go to sleep early when we can, but um, no fishing yet. Yeah. Not yeah. one day of fishing yeah. yet. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and we those, got a, there's a river literally yeah. 50 yards right there with big trout and some smallmouth in there. Um, speaking of the daily, what what does the day to day look like for you? I mean, you said you upload multiple times a day. What time do you get up, and when do you put that camera in front of your face? It's all relative because we've got a six year old, an eleven yeah. year old, and a fourteen year old. Oh, so wow. they've got to be at school at three different times in the morning at three different schools, picked <laughs> up at three different times. Oh my so gosh! Sometimes I'm filming a video at eleven o'clock at night. Sometimes at six o'clock in the morning. Sometimes it's whenever I got a spare second, and I don't plan anything. I just get out there. Maybe two or three minutes before I do the video, I think about what I want to do, just knock it out, and then get back to whatever work I got. So why three a day? Why Is that an algorithm thing? Is that like data-driven, like you need to hit three a day for YouTube to do its thing for you? Yeah, it's like my deal with it. It's like um, the, the quantity of it increases my watch time and my views, which increases ad revenue, something like that. Right. Mm-hmm. If, I, if I only put out one video a day, I don't think that one video a day is going to equal more views out there. So if I put out two videos a day, um, I can maintain the amount of views I consistently get every week with that. And since my videos are short, you know, four to 10 minutes long, people, they have time to watch that. It's not like it doesn't take a big commitment for them to sit down for a half hour and watch a video. Wow. But uh, like, so I guess, because I know you can't put as many ads obviously in a short video. So, um, but I would have to think with that many views, you're still doing fairly well on the revenue side. Yeah, the, it's been really good. I It's been, you know, YouTube has been extremely profitable because you got a lot of different avenues. You got your memberships. You got different ways you can parlay, you know, that into 
super thanks and chats and ad revenue and then the affiliate linking programs yeah. that go with it. Those change Those go all the crazy. time. crazy. Affiliate they, linking. And and this is what I'll say. Okay, so me and you have bumped heads like in the past over politics. Like mm -hmm. we know this. Um, that's all right. And, but, <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> I bump heads way. with people. It yeah. is what it is. American. But we're sitting here able mm -hmm. to have a conversation. So it is, you know, that's what makes America, America. But Buttermore used to call me and he'd be like, and Buttermore's like the number two guy at Mega Bass in America. Like he is the man. I love the dude. And he would call me and he'd be like, uh, I know you don't get along with Randy, but he's moving some product with yeah. that YouTube. And yeah. he'd always, he'd say, dude, all he has to do is like mention it, like sniff about a product. And we've got retailers calling us like, how do I get this product? He just mentioned people are asking, how do I get it? And uh, he was like, I mean, this was year, like, I don't know when you first started, but this is pretty early on that he was like, trait he's moving product mm -hmm. this is my third year with it i got in late to the game with it with that so it's and it, it's just like with you guys out there that i think the secret to doing well on youtube it's all about the personality and mm -hmm. people some people are going to mesh with your personality like oil and some sure. people will be like oil and water that's why for the most part most successful youtubers they're a little bit polarized you know yeah. with their audience out there i've got 80% of my audience that loves me and I could call them up right now, say, Hey man, I got a problem. I need your help. And they come down here and I got 20% that just wish I'd fall in the lake and never come up. But there. they help the algorithm. Every yeah. time they, they watch all your videos, right. they comment on every one of them. Yeah. Do you ever take any of these? Well, do you ta ever take any of these comments personally? Well, uh, most of them, it's like, I, I, I have no problem with any type of civil debate. I mean, nobody does, but when somebody Attacks. has a vicious personal attack for right. no reason, sure. that I just usually delete or block those yeah. people. I don't have time to jack with that. Yeah. There. I mean, internet bullies. I've never, you know, I, I've never been into like attacking the messenger. Right. You know, sure. I want to discuss the message there, and you can have some differences with that. Sure. But a lot of people are unable to have a civil debate on social media. Yeah. There's, you, you find out a lot about the nature of, yeah. of human behavior, you know, when you're a the psychology, YouTube creator. Yeah. What makes mm -hmm. them tick and stuff. Yeah. I, I say the same thing. Um, it's always interesting because the comments are like, Trait needs to shut up. She doesn't need to be on the podcast, blah, blah, blah. You know, she only wants her opinion to be relevant. And those very people are telling me I have to have their opinion. Right. Like exactly. only their opinion's relevant. Yeah. It's like the irony is yeah. hilarious. Yeah, when you have any opinion, you're going to get criticized for it. I mean, I have some dudes. I've had I had one dude that said he was going to show up and fight me at Lake of the Ozarks oh since the photo series. Gosh. He got so mad at me. <laughs> what was I'm, that over? Uh, it God, it was. I can't even remember what it was at this point. It was just some some video I did on the get... fluorocarbon line <laughs> or something. Oh my gosh! I mean, just something that they were insulted by, or I I don't know what it is, but I get people like that all the time. It's. There's some, it, some crazy dudes. You are correct, though. When it comes, I would say, like, I have an understanding, especially, like, behind the scenes. It's something I'm more involved in when it comes to, like, brand building and stuff. And if you're someone who rides the fence, you're it's next near impossible to build a legit <laughs> brand. Yeah. Like, you have to have something. You have to stand for something. And standing for something or having an opinion or feeling on something automatically makes you a little polarizing. Mm -hmm. And there are people in our industry, and I talk to brands all the time about this. I talk to Chris, you know, when it comes to how we do the podcast and his YouTube, and they've got plenty of trophies lined up. And I tell him, God, I wish I had those trophies th that they have along with his personality and what he does, because I could sell, I mean, I could do some crazy things on the sell side, but if you just have trophies and you ride that fence, mm -hmm. it's still hard to sell. Yeah. In today's world. Um, and, and it just comes with social media. People want to know you. They want to identify with you. And it's hard to identify with someone who rides the fence yeah. and could lean both ways. <clears throat> you know, it's just not how it works. Yeah, it's the, the this whole thing with, with social media and YouTube, it, it changed so quick. I mean, it just it happened in like a three or four year period where it just completely flipped the whole reality of this industry out there. And it's like, you, you're hearing it more and more about how tournament angling and the, the brand, brand building impressions from that is just going away completely. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that gets talked about enough because not. I think from a business perspective, that's a, that's just a huge aspect. Right. I mean, all of these companies that I deal with and even heard of, 
there's not such a thing as a pro fisherman anymore. You're an influencer, influencer. that happens to fish, and you're not a pro angler. And if you can't do that, then unless you're independently wealthy, you're not going to make it. Well, you're not. Period. In, in the beginning, right, when you first started fishing, the only avenue for you to sell that product was tournaments because those tournaments were getting the editorial side. That's right. where all the attention was. But when the attention moved to other platforms, then you had to adapt. So it's still the same premise. You still have to sell product for your sponsor. You still have to get eyes on you. Mm. But now it's not just like the majority of the eyes are no longer on those editorial magazines, which only feature feature the pros. Yeah. Now it's on YouTube and anyone can be there and it mm -hmm. doesn't matter that you just fish tournaments. So it's, it's the same yeah. premise. Uh, me and Dave Mercer talk about this a lot. Like you still, you've never not had to sell for your sponsors. You've mm -hmm. never not had to find a way um, to move their product. It's just a totally different ballgame yeah. of how that occurs now. Yeah. Yeah, with so many topics you talked about you know you get up you got the three kids uh, you know gonna take one this time and that time it's such a busy schedule you know before you hit the record button and say okay i'm gonna upload this video or this topic um you know like what goes through your head like okay let's okay let's let's talk about you know this newest crankbait or, or whatever the topic is that morning are there times where like you're almost insecure about the topic you're talking about and almost kind of like force it? Now, I don't watch all your videos, but I would have an extremely hard time coming up with a, to uh, a topic uh, that's kind of relevant uh, or interesting every single day. Three and I guess that goes day. to your experience. I mean, you're tr triple the experience I have. But do you ever feel like, ah, oh, this probably won't do so well, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway? Oh, sure. Yeah. It's like, I mean, I try to base all of my technique stuff on like seasonal patterns mm -hmm. and ap applying them to different scenarios and geographical parts of the country. So you have really an unlimited amount of content there. But at the same time, those, those, the views that you get on that are pretty mediocre for mm -hmm. the most part, <clears throat> unless you hit something about some secret technique or sure. tactic, which is, you know, occasionally but most people want to hear opinion videos on current events and the problem with that is you can't do that all the time because then you lose your educational value on right. the channel so right. which is selling important. baits yeah, Very exactly important. so the, there's a fine line between the the content creation if it was up to me i would i'd love to do nothing except opinion stuff because i've that's where my passion lies more but then everybody would hate me if I just did that all the time, you know, talk about controversial right. topics. Mm -hmm. But it's a lot more engaging and fun from my my perspective. Have you ever had a sponsor <laughs> call and say, Randy, we gotta pull we <laughs> gotta me. pull that video? Have you ever had that happen? Sponsors call? Nope, I have not yeah. had that yet. Good. No, full I, support. Full yeah, support. Yeah. Because I, I try to frame it in a context where it's like it at least it gets you thinking about there. Cause I mean, I, I remember I did a video on Lake Mead about nine months ago with the low water levels mm -hmm. yeah. and i was talking about climate change mitigation which the state talks about and they right. mention it i lost 500 subscribers in one day did you when really I did that video simply because the the word climate, climate change yeah. offended so many people out there so we just and, did a video with um uh, the ceo of battleborn and it's the most american made battery here and they're almost they're this close to being fully made in America. Mm. Most patriotic thing ever, right? And then at the end, he t asked the guy about like electric cars and stuff like that. And the guy kind of gave his talks about climate change and all that greatness. And then people in the comments were like, he had me until he started talking about that. And they went nuts. And it's like, this dude is trying to bring mm. on shore all this lithium production instead of relying on China. And you just negate all exactly, that because yeah. he has one little opinion that, that doesn't, you know, match up yeah. with yours. Well, it was like that yesterday. I did a video on uh, Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey. I was trying to relate this, <laughs> nice. I was trying to, relate this to bass fishing. And yeah. it's like, I had no idea that tra Taylor Swift was so controversial. Oh, I don't yeah. even, I don't know any songs she, and I got all these comments saying, I can't believe you'd bring up Taylor Swift. She's blah, blah, blah. I oh, mean, just my gosh. political affiliation yeah. type stuff. But yeah. that was not the point of the video. <laughs> I was trying to tie it into, you know, how, how people, they watch, they, I mean, people would rather be entertained than educated is the point of the video. Right. But do you think that you play though? This is, 
you know, when we used to butt heads on Twitter, you think that you play on like a very slippery slope, you know, with some of the things you say, like, okay, like, do you ever say, okay, maybe I took that one too far or my rhetoric was just a <laughs> little too, because here's the thing. And when it comes to Trump, like anytime he would ever do good, then he would just go, just take it places that you're like, you're making it hard for me to defend you here. Your rhetoric is like, you know, this, you took it too far. Like, do you ever think, you know, maybe, just maybe you take some things a little too far? It's, I think it is sometimes, <laughs> but you know, what I, what I try to do is I try, I try to make a point subtly where I don't come out and like, you know, just give my blatant opinion. I try, I try right. to like, you know, bring up a topic and maybe let somebody, maybe make them, them think a little bit. Yeah. So that comes across as less offensive mm -hmm. with that. So it's, but yeah, anytime there's topics out there, there's controversial topics that, you know, that's, you know, it's coming. I mean, I, if I do anything, any type of environmental topic, or if I talk about, you know, anti-technology mm -hmm. or, or that I don't like braid to floor carbon, I mean, anytime you have a strong opinion, yeah. you're going to get attacked. I mean, there's it. no doubt. I got, I do have some questions when it comes to like the environmental side. Cause Sorry, this, is, Susan, come on. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we used to get into it on Twitter about, but it seems like fishing, especially bass fishing, and we use a lot of line and a lot of, especially when there were two strokes, we do a lot of things that to me seem to impact uh, the environment. And we don't have to go crazy on this, right? Yeah. I'm not trying to piss everyone off uh, who's watching. But how, I mean, for someone that I've seen some of your views, how do you like balance that? Because you, our, our industry is a pretty tough when yep. it comes to to that stance on the environment if you feel that way? Well, you know, just the fact, I mean, you consume resources just from being alive and breathing. Yeah. I mean, it, we are all consumers with that. But I think one of the things that I try to stress when I talk about environmental issues is people can make incremental changes as far as how they live with their life with like recycling and reducing and reusing that type of stuff. But real change only comes through legislation, and that is sort of what I try to focus on. You can, when you're talking about a microcosm, you're talking about something that doesn't make a big impact, mm -hmm. even over a long period of time. But when you change legislation, you make huge impacts. It's, it's prime examples when I was sponsored by, you know, Boone Pickens, the Pickens Plan. Yeah, you know, right. Dude's I a billionaire. That. I yeah. got a chance to fish yeah. with him, and anyway, I was fishing with him on his ranch in Texas, down there in West Texas, and he was telling me about his his wind project his his you know solar not solar but his his windmill projects mm -hmm. he spent like 900 million dollars building these windmills all across you know this was back, this is back over a decade ago yeah, or, yeah longer 15 years all ago. across western oklahoma and texas out there and he said that he had to completely scrap that project after he spent almost a billion dollars because he could not get congress to pass the infrastructure you know uh, funding that he needed to trans to, to, tr to transmit that power, which is a political issue. That yeah. So that's what's a prime example of how legislation affects any type of environmental movement. There. Wow. Do you think that we're doing a good job in um, bass fishing when it comes to um, lobbying and things like that? Because I, if I remember correctly, back in the day, wasn't Bassmaster more heavily involved in that sort of thing when it came to lobbying and stuff like yep. that? And it just doesn't seem like there's any political arm at Bassmaster these days. In the 70s, Ray Scott was very influential with water quality issues and, you know, different type of pollution mm -hmm. issues. But now it's sort of been morphed into conservation and conservation and environmental issues within the sport are not the same things. I mean, conservation is about preserving the resource and creating habitat for fish and the environmental issues get into point source pollution things like pumping you know turkey you know turkey crap into grand lake over there from mm -hmm. tyson's you know the plant over there they've been slapped on the wrist a thousand times they they're still, doing that right now oh they still pump it in really they, they, i mean that away. goes in all over the place yeah. i mean have you, you you guys have fished lake you fall in alabama have yeah you? oh you don't mm -hmm. smell have you been up the chattahoochee river there and and investigated the river banks there is little white pipes you know spewing this toxic chemical smell and stuff into the river everywhere up the chattahoochee river from those yeah. paper plants and paper, all right. i got no idea what that stuff is but that's what we're talking about that you know, we need to bring to the learn sure. Because one of the things I found out about bass anglers and hunters in general is a lot of times when you're talking about 
environmental issues as far as, uh, you know, legislation, a lot of them vote against their best uh, own best interests in stopping stuff like that. You know, when you're trying to put a stop to, you know, just what I mentioned there, it doesn't happen out there. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of apathy involved with it. I'll that. say, you know, because I'm extremely conservative, that's not a secret. And I've always been against like, it's for me, that becomes a slippery slope and all just a ton of regulations. You know, I feel like we use, more things get regulated, the more rights we lose. And so that's where I get scared, you know, like I understand, obviously, I don't want the water quality to go down. We look at Clear Lake. Mm -hmm. It's not a secret. Something's going on at Clear Lake, whatever gets dumped in there to cause that algae to be this bright teal color, whatever mm -hmm. color it is. But but then I also I'm on the side of the slippery slope mm -hmm. slide that if they can regulate that. What else are they going right. to regulate that uh, takes away my freedoms to fish and things like that? Yeah, there's you know? a balance that's got to be reached there for sure. But um, right now, that balance is tipped towards, you know, the other side more than the others. So, but I agree with you. I mean, you can't have it. You can't be all in on one side out there. Uh, on the topic of, of kind of politics, it's, I mean, there's, everyone knows like American politics in this day and age is probably the nastiest it's ever been. I mean, you've got the right side, you got the left side, they're always battling, you're always seeing all these different clips and things of different issues all across the way. Um, there are a lot of people who aren't involved in tournament bass fishing, but we talk about some of those who have been lucky enough to be in this industry for so long. Um, you know, when we talk about like tournament fishing politics, what does that mean to you? Like what, like to the viewers who don't know what like politics behind the scenes is, what's like one of the examples uh, that's kind of concerning, uh, in your opinion, in tournament politics or fishing politics? You mean you're talking about within the industry? Within itself? our industry, our small industry of fishing. Oh, man. That um, like the split's a great example that we always fall on on this show because we 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 saw we a saw lot of that behind the scenes <laughs> politicking going on that influences certain ideas or views and things and a lot of the viewers just don't quite you know understand but yeah um, are there any like are you concerned about any of like this this backdoor politics and in, in the sport of bass fishing or tournament fishing or anything like that. Well, you know, I think, yeah, a lot of it goes back to, you know, I know forward-facing sonar issues has been beaten at the ground a sure. little bit out there, but it goes back into the, uh, you know, to the tradition of the sport a little bit. Tradition. And as far as the money that's involved with it like that. Yeah. And, you know, to a large degree, I mean, money influences professional fishing. Forward-facing sonar is a prime example of it. That's, mm -hmm. I think that's one of the reasons that everybody got behind the banning of the A-Rig. There wasn't any money in the A-Rig. But when you've got, you know, companies that are, you know, subsidizing tournament organizations with seven-figure, uh, re you know, retainers over multiple-year contracts, you know, that creates some type of a situation where you may not be doing the right thing all the time for the sport. Yeah. So and you, a good example. I understand that part, you know, when it comes to organizations and where they, they're paid and stuff, right? Um, but do you not think that the government or, let's say, Texas Parks and Wildlife um, – doesn't care because they make a lot of money on their resources, right? They sell a lot of fishing licenses. Like their job is to keep these fisheries in good shape so people keep fishing. Do you not think that they're capable of um, staying up on the data and figuring out what needs to happen on their end? I think each state varies with that. Obviously, Texas sets the bar. They you know, I think they ob absolutely have the best conservation department out there. Not all of them are equal, though. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of them are late to the party. And when you're talking about, like, let's use, for example, the forward-facing sonar and the, quote, data that they're gathering mm -hmm. with that, you know what the data is for the most part that they're gathering? Mm -hmm. Conservation agents are interviewing dudes that come off the water. <laughs> this is true. And, and you get this dude that, <laughs> yep. you know, he walks up there, he's got a six-pack of Bud Light yep. on his beer. Guy asking, well, how many fish did you catch today? How's what the size? Right. Th th how do we know that guy's telling Tell the, the truth? truth. It's right. like, it's just like in, 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 in trials, you know, eyewitness accounts are the least reliable type of data or information sure. out there. So you can't sure. come across and say, oh, we've got these surveys and data and scientific right. studies that FFS is doing this or that right. until you can actually provide, 
you know, facts, with instrumentation or whatever like that, you're never going to get some the reality of the situation right. with that. So I, I called up um, Todd, um, Todd Driscoll. You probably know who that is. He's the head of the Black Bass. He's the main biologist uh, for Texas Parks and Wildlife when it comes to Black Bass. And then he connected me with um, Jake Norman, and he's actually the guy who's trying to figure out this forward-facing sonar stuff. And Jake was awesome to talk to. He's very open, you know, and he also talked about how a lot of the data is limited. You know, he talked about how the hard part about, uh, you know, with bass, like you said, they're doing krill surveys, right? And that's reliant on the people. And he said, you know, with bass, it's mainly the people targeting them. It's catch and release, right? So it's hard outside of what they tell you they're catching per, you know, what you think is per hour. You know, there's not a lot of um, bad data when it mm-hmm. comes to forward facing sonar. He said, but then when you, and it's based on krill surveys, right? And people, but when you look at crappie, it's a different story. Mm-hmm. You know, they are seeing, you know, people are who are catching them with forward facing sonar are having a little more success, right? Mm-hmm. And so that could be concerning. Um, and then uh, when we asked about the delayed mortality aspect, he said, it's, uh, next near impossible to get the data on mm-hmm. you know and and so they're struggling they're, that's what they're trying to figure out how do we even track that right. side so um because i've listened to uh several people trying to talk and put points out there and um even josh jones was on our podcast and he said 70 percent blah 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 delayed mortality and and i talked to both biologists and they're like we, we're not sure who told him that but we can't track that mm-hmm. you know we would if we could but we can't well here's a prime example it Last week at my gym, there was a guy, he's a kayak bass fisherman, and he was saying, he goes, I decided finally to get forward-facing sonar. So I, I got it, went down to Table Rock Lake. We had a little club kayak tournament down there. And he goes, the first three fish I caught, when I re- you know, caught them deep, suspended, mm-hmm. he goes, when I got them up to the surface, obviously he caught them deep. He said they, they well, I don't know, they died, but he said they wouldn't go back down. They just sat there swimming on the surface. He didn't know anything about fizzing. Yeah. And so he used that example there as far as the damage directly related to the forward-facing sonar. So there's a lot of issues with bear trauma as far as the, the eye damage the fish gets, you know, the internal damage that comes with it. It's we're, it's too soon to, to know on there. But I do right. know one That's thing. It's like, you know, I fished Table Rock Lake since 1969. I've been thousands of days on the lake there. And I do on-the-water lessons for jerk baits all winter long. Nice. So I'm on the lake at least once a week. And I have noticed a precipitous decline in the quality of just regular fishing as far as going out there and just fishing with standard ways of catching them, yeah. throwing a jerk bait on secondary points, you know, cranking a wiggle wart down the yeah. bank, whatever. The quality of fishing has declined noticeably. And I, all my buddies that guide down there have said the same thing. Yet you talk to the conservation department and said, oh, we haven't noticed bad or good. I notice it. My buddies notice it. Yeah. People... Guys, I know that I've lived in this area around my entire life have noticed it. That it's, there's a reality to that situation that I think we're in denial about. Now, all the, did all those fish, you know, you know, succumb to fishing pressure and move offshore and go out in open water to sp- suspend, or have they been flayed out? Have they right. died from delayed mortality? I right. mean, so that's what um, he said. Like, and and again, I understand you saying, you know, they're talking to people you know, Joe Blow, you know, right. on the shore or whatever. From a 14-foot like. aluminum boat right. all yeah. the way up to a $80,000 bass. But boat. they said, you know, when it comes to bass, the, the catch rate per hour is pretty much the same. It, it really hasn't changed. Doing the same curl surveys they've always done. Um, and then the harvest rates didn't really matter on the bass side because most bass anglers don't keep their fish. Um, and then on the crappie side, that's where they saw, like, People using forward-facing sonar had become more efficient. Mm -hmm. Their catch rate was higher. It's like 1.5 per hour versus one to the guy who wasn't using forward-facing sonar. Um, But they did admit, you know, the the when it comes to harvesting, or that was harvest one one and a half fish per hour versus one. Um, They did, and the catch rate was with crappie 2.3 fish per hour versus without forward facing sonar 1.75. Yeah. So they admitted on the crappie side, you know, that could stack up. And then um so the question was, well what about which I think is a value uh, viable question, trophy size fish, right? Like mm-hmm. 
are we harming the genetics of the bigger fish? Uh, and they said on the crappie side that used to, you didn't see those fish being caught. And then now about 2.7% of the fish harvested with forward facing sonar are trophy size. Two plus pounders over 15 inches. Yeah, over 15 inches. And mm-hmm. he said that those fish were not being caught really before mm-hmm. forward facing sonar. So he, he said that that is a, a question, a concern that they have. Um, and they did a bunch of simulations, um, you know, out, and they don't feel like the, with all the simulations they did, like there's a major uh, uh, impact to the population. But he did admit on the trophy side. And by the way, it, this is one of the biologists down in Texas. This uh, is the guy who is leading the forward facing sonar, Sam Rayburn, trying to figure it Toledo out. Toledo Ben, yeah. Fork, they do all these different creel surveys. Again, it's they're interviewing the guy in the mm-hmm. boat that comes off the water. Hey, what did you catch? Are you using forward facing sonar? This and that. She actually prepared a little bit for this this morning, like literally <laughs> like two hours ago. She was on the phone with him, so she took all these notes. Um, but yeah, he did, you know, and then take, I asked him, you know, just take your badge off, like in your opinion, your personal opinion, I mean, if it matters, uh, you know, is it harming, uh, you know, is forward facing sonar harming our fish populations, our bass populations? He says, just like he said, it's, it's still too early to tell. Um, uh, but he is a big fan of yours and he agrees with pretty much everything you say. Well, here, here's, he does. Yeah. That's what he said. <laughs> oh, yeah. I didn't hear that part. Here's the problem I think we have with the conservation departments on this because the technology that we have, whether it be, you know, the electronic technology or the bait technology, mm-hmm. like in the, the, the uh, I mean, we just have, we have so much better lures now than we did even 10 or 15 years ago. And people know so much more about fat bass fishing. So I think that this creates an illusion that the bass fishing is sustainable or better simply because of that technology. Now, if you take the how educated the anglers are and you take the bait technology away from them, you take the electronic technology away from them, then you have a more accurate baseline. But I think what happens is we have fewer and fewer bass in our lake now than we ever have before, but we're so good at catching them that it creates this illusion that our fisheries are sustainable. But I can tell you as somebody that fishes a bunch on Tabor Rock Lake, something is something is wrong. Something yeah. is not right. But would you say, though, the conservation has gotten better too? So, to me, that yes, technology anglers, um, the gear they have is they're catching more, able to you know uh, what you just said. But also, our conservation has incrementally gotten better, and the education and the catch and release. Uh, they do, but I just I don't I don't want to sound disrespectful to the conservation departments, but I've talked to them a bunch. I mean, I used to have a forty acre lake of my own, mm-hmm. and I had the conservation department up there working with them. I did not agree with a lot of their findings because my personal experience on managing my own lake yeah. did not agree with that. Would you say though that's lake specific? Because that's that, one thing. I when I did talk to the two biologists, I, t- I talked to one yesterday and one today. Uh, they <laughs> did bring that point up. It depends on the lake, you know, like the lakes, if you looked at data that's specific to each lake, completely different. But an overall big picture average, you know, that's the data they were giving me. Yeah. I'm just using the experience I have from so many years of fishing here in the Ozarks Mm -hmm. with it. And, you know, I've seen it firsthand. I'll give you guys a prime example of the impact. And I'm curious to hear you guys' point on, on how you think this is impacting it. I fished a BFL tournament mid-April, Tabor Rock, this past year. Mm -hmm. There was, we had 225 boats in our tournament. KVD Big Bass Bash was going on the same day. This was a Saturday, 500 and something boats. There was a 150 boat kayak tournament there. There was a high school college tournament All the there, same day? Same day. Wow. And club tournaments. They estimated over a 1,000 bass boats. Yep. There was an accident that day. No, now, no. if you figure there's a 1,000 dudes out there on the lake in one day, how many fish died that day yeah. just on the lake in one day? And this oh. happens every weekend. Yeah. This that's, is not- that's a, that's, I'll give you that. That is a very valid point. The mortality aspect, because we talk to people off the record, we will never throw them under the bus. Um, people that catch giant fish and they do admit mm-hmm. fish are dying. I'm killing, these people are saying I'm killing fish, big fish. Mm. And, and that's the one point that the biologists today said, we don't have the data, but you could tell there's, 
concern because mm. people, a lot of these people who have this technology don't know about fish care. They don't know that when they're pulling them up from these steps, what they're doing to them. They don't know how to help them once they get them up there too. You know, I admit like that is. Well, and then again, if the, if the Department of Conservation wanted to really help out, they could get with the Corps of Engineers or the Chamber of Commerce and they say, you guys cannot issue this many tournament permits yeah. in one day. Yeah, this is ridiculous. Absolutely. You know, you're going to have to stop letting your greed outweigh, yeah. you know, the future of the sport here. But yeah. I, nobody's done. It's the same with Grand Lake. Yeah. Ever since yeah. they put in that Wolf Creek facility, Grand Lake has went down the tubes. Wow. Yeah. Big times. Well, even, you know, if take the forward facing sonar part out of this conversation, right? Even if this technology didn't exist, it's a safety issue. Hmm. Um, there should never be that many people. Hmm for tournaments, right? You're not even counting just the recreational guys. Mm -hmm. You know, the lakes are public waters. So for recreational guys' sake, you shouldn't have that many tournament permitted people on the water, you know, so that they can come and enjoy that body of water mm -hmm. that weekend as well. Like that's just, to me, bad business. What yeah. you just said about Table Rock and your experiences, these large tournaments and and for sure, I mean, we're, we're hurting that resource. Um, it's, it's kind of an echo of what I heard from, you know, the beautiful St. Lawrence river. Um, some of the guys we fish with who fish there their whole lives with the initials CJ, uh, they, um, they pretty much said the exact same thing you said up there and with, you know, with Garmin live scope, with, with the technology, they said they are seeing a stupid, uh, amount of decrease in the catches in the size um and so forth so um that's pretty interesting to hear on you know from the ozarks all the way up to st lawrence and everywhere in between that we never hear about that kind of impact well we're loving it to death I yeah mean, thing about it and there are there, there's simply just too many tournaments i mean yeah. I, i'm coming from a tournament angler yeah and i've seen the progression of it over the 80s 90s to yeah. we have today and at some point, somebody's got to just say, hey, look, we have got to start. There's got to be some regulations put in place to make sure there's something left, man. Yeah. We can't, this is a path of unsustainability, what we're doing with our fisheries. And so many people that I talk to, they have this mental picture in their mind that you've got a 50,000 acre lake like this. And it's just, there's an infinite number of bass in there. <laughs> there's not, there's a finite number of fish in these lakes out there. And you know how long it takes for bass to get three pounds and and the odds they have to overcome yes. to survive to yes. three pounds that's a rarity but the, but there. when these um departments of wildlife are going out there and shocking these lakes they're not seeing from what i understand decreases in the population maybe they're harder to catch you know maybe they're more educated Something because their surveys aren't saying that there's a, a decrease in population of fish. I haven't seen any shocking studies. And I also, haven't. I don't know the depth they're shocking at. Sure. Right. Well, you can I mean, only shock, from what I understand, you can only go so deep, right? That's why, um, and, and the bigger fish, you can't even shock up hmm. because what, what were they saying? They, I think you can go eight foot or so or yeah. something like yeah, that. Yeah. But, but the bigger fish, um, I forget what how they explained it, but you can't shock them well, up. And There's, then, like, when are they shocking? If they're shocking in April, yeah, yeah. they're going to get a bunch of fish. All the fish are yeah, shallow, but yeah. it's like, that's... Th it's a hard study. But, but but if still, if they're shocking them up, they exist. Yeah. You yeah, know? But, yeah, it's a little skewed, in, in my opinion. I mean, just, again, that example, that St. Lawrence River uh, example up there, I mean, those smallmouth are 10, 12, 14 years old. I mean, heck, five and six pounders. Um that if you go to a weigh-in, some of those, you know, not only our tournaments, but that big, the Kingston Open they have up there. I've been to those weigh-ins before. And all those tiny, you know, uh, constricted pupils you see at the weigh-in, like those fish aren't going to swim back, yeah. dude. They are absolutely not. And all over social media, too. A lot of it, where it's gained so much attention up there. You know, a lot of people from Florida, a lot of people from Georgia go and visit in, in July and August just for that picture. And when those pupils are that big, those fish are gone, mm -hmm. like gone. Ain't going to make it back. And that's like what, a 12-year-old fish or something? Yeah, that's yeah, super that's, old, yeah absolutely. So here's my question then. And look, you know, people, I got to ask these things because it is valid whether I agree with this or not. So say someone catches a 12-year fish. And that's a fish that never probably would have been touched without forward-facing mm -hmm. sonar. Why does it matter? I mean, if we weren't going to catch it before and we catch it now and say it does pass away, 
and it, but it's old, so it was coming at genetics. some point. How can she spread her genetics moving forward? Look, I, I'm just asking. Yeah, I you mean, know? I, I'm I'm asking if we would have never saw that fish to begin with, then why is it a big deal that we're catching it now? Yeah, hey. Well, and it all goes back into the whole forward facing sonar deal. And I, I don't think that I know people get burned out on it and they don't yeah. want to hear about it, but it's, it is such a huge impactful part of our sport. You mm-hmm. can't have a fish, a conversation on bass fishing yep. without talking about it. You simply can't do that. Mm-hmm. So we have to ask ourselves, it's like, is it worth it? Is it worth us for us to progress to this mm-hmm. at, at the risk of the future of our sport? And I've always been the, the person like, you guys watch Yellowstone? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. remember when John, well, I mean, because if you didn't watch Yellowstone, it wouldn't make Big any difference. Big fan of Beth. Yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> I can see that. I, but anyway, remember when John's up there, he's talking about, he goes, he goes, I am anti-progress. He goes, I'm the wall oh, yeah. progress. Yes. And hits, and I goes, I, that's me right yeah. there. And there's, a, there's wisdom to what he said there. Yes. Mm-hmm. Because progress what he was talking about takes away so much of the intrinsic value of what he's trying to protect what i'm trying to protect and it and even for you chris here's the thing i mean you in my opinion you are you are the top big swim bait pro out there period i mean oliver and i didn't fish tournaments so you know you and oliver i are the swim bait gurus Mm -hmm. forward facing sonar is taking away your ability yes. to win tournaments on your strength there. Yeah. Now, unless you're unless you happen to get set up at Fork or let OHIV where they'll hit stuff like that. Yes. But for the most part, your your wheelhouse is being diminished by that because yep. you simply can't win against it. You know, if you went down to Tabor Rock with your techniques 15 years ago, you'd probably win any tournament Russia, down there in the pre-spawn sure. on a big swim bait. Sure. But now you might catch a big bag one day, but some guy weenie worming out there in 80 foot of water is going to beat you by the end of the tournament. Yep. And I that's, just, and, and that's what I don't like because yeah. I would rather see Chris Aldane chunking that eight inch swim bait down a bluff bank. Like you did at bull shoals yeah. down there than watching some guy going like this. Absolutely. And I it's the same thing with the jerk bait with you. You're reading the wind. You're, it starts that morning where you, you want to know which way the wind is blowing, you know, okay, I'm going to select these types of banks and these transition banks jerk bait suspending jerk bait or a big swim bait whatever it is um a lot of times you will get your butt smoked by that guy in the winning i don't i agree to an extent with what you're saying because i i refuse to fish with the technology i don't get to fish that much anymore and so when we do go fishing you know (laughs) because i can't turn it off (laughs) i make him turn it off because i'm more like want to call my shots i want to you know i want to say there should be a bass right there i don't want to know before i make the cast but what I will say on the tournament side uh, from someone who cares about the the content that's put out there and the media that we're putting, um, if he can see a fish about to buy on live scope, he's not going to give me the same theatrics as when one smokes, smokes his one bait, bait yeah. without him knowing, you know, he's going to full blown give me that Zaldane just like, oh my God, blah, blah, blah. But when, on live hmm. scope, it's going to be more of like, here she comes, here she comes, there she is, you know, and, and that's two different excitements. It is. And that's where, th- that is where like somebody like Chase Anderson has missed a huge opportunity to be because right. he could have owned this whole thing. He said, you know, we he, if he would have said, okay, we thought about this thing and our viewers would rather see Chris Aldane chunk a 10 inch swim bait catching a 10 pounder down a bank than some guy weenie warming around. And in order to protect the tradition of the sport, and the enthusiasm of our viewer, we decided that, you know, we're just going to limit it to, you know, 2D sonar, down imaging, side imaging. They're not, that's, that is our benchmark. We're not going to go past that. Do you know the home run that would be for bass? Yeah. They, they, there would be so many people on board with that, that it would, it would increase their stock unbelievable. But I also just, think that's a little bit of a slippery slope. In what way? Right. I think that, I think that maybe that time does come, but, um, and I don't care about the rig. I think it's the dumbest thing ever. I said it back then. I thought it's a boring way to fish, not my gig. But also, I don't want them to react um, and, and, and make a, I think a regulation's coming at some point, but I don't want them to go too far with it um, without truly saying, okay, after this year, like there has to be changes. Like I want them to be able to tell the anglers this is why, that this is legitimately why, 
and have something to stand on so that if something else comes up, they can't just make a knee jerk reaction. Mm. That That's my opinion. You know, yeah, I, I and I'm not disagreeing with you. I think it's, bo- I do think it's boring to watch. I think if you're a purist who really fishing is what you do, what you lived on, you don't, and you try and go with forward facing sonar. You know it's not the same excitement. You know if you take your nephew fishing, like he's not going to have that same passion looking at a screen that he does when something bites that he didn't anticipate. Mm -hmm. And anyone who argues differently, they probably sucked at fishing before. No matter what they want to tell the world, Mm -hmm. they sucked. Because any any person knows it's not the same feeling. It's not the same excitement. It's there's nothing pure about it. Based on uh, based on just, you know, everyone has an opinion these days with social media, but based on some of the comments you receive, uh, some of the feedback you receive from anglers, text messages and things mm-hmm. like that, it, it's not a 50-50. It's not 54 forward-facing sonar and 50 against. In your opinion, just, you know, by looking at what's out there, what do you, th- in your opinion, what is the number of people for in the fishing industry and people against forward facing sonar? On my percentages, de- well, on my demographic, and I, which is 45 and older, like that for the most part, it's without a doubt over 80%. Against. 80%, yeah. I think you've got 80% that are adamant against it. You got 10% that are apathetic and they don't care one way or the other. Yep. You got 10% that are all in. You got yep. the, the hardcore live scopers yep. and it's like balls to the wall and technology. No holds barred. Let's keep it moving. Yep. Can I make a statement about that? I'm not calling you old. This is your podcast. I am old. I'm pre- I just turned 62. <laughs> I know, but dude, not. Citizen, you look man. great Mike, for 62. Yeah. Mike McCollum, yeah. though, I think he, I offended him a few times because I kept calling him old. <laughs> but, um, but okay, so your your demographic is 80%. Well, I would say your demographic is kind of like our product is aging and fishing, right? Aging out, I'll even say. Mm-hmm. And we do need to focus a lot about what the younger demographics care about because that's our new viewers. Those are the viewers we need. Those are the people we need to start buying product. So even if your demographic hates it, Mm -hmm. does your demographic need to outweigh um, the new audience? Well, my demographic has the most buying power. You know, that's the, the, they have the most income, they're in the most income, uh, money to spend on fish and tackle and stuff like that. But as far as to answer your question there, um, I don't know, I don't know what that looks like moving forward in the future, because by the time those 20 year old guys now are, you know, 40 years old, what are we going to have in technology in 20 years? That's what's really scary to me. Yeah. But what if we lose them as fishermen um, and, and then your demographic ages out and then we don't even have people fishing anymore? That's why we have to educate them to what, fishing really is as far as the things in bass fishing that make you feel alive yeah. you know understanding seasonal movements and behavior bass mood and personality attacking targets from different angles understanding your boat positioning in relationship to current and wind yes that's a the good art fisherman. forms with it yeah. and that's what that's what sucks about for guys that have been in a long time because they have spent decades mastering the art form of bass fishing mastering the art form of casting at different angles and so much, so many variables to it, and it's worthless now. But I would say, like, I've been telling him, if you gave those guys, like, really taught them how to use forward facing sonar, they would be back on top, kicking these guys who only know how to use that graph because they don't have those instincts. Uh. So if you were to take, I, I think, dude, it, I mean, I think if you take someone with your talent and then apply the FFS to it that those guys would then be back on top. Do you but think if you started using forward-facing sonar I and sucked. a little bit of fishing you, you do, I think you I think would, you'd increase? I, I'm a nerd, so I probably would be good with forward-facing sonar. But you don't sonar, like it, though. But I hate it. Yeah. So I never I never use it in the opens. I refuse. I, hmm. But everyone knows in the opens, like I was this purist running around who didn't really want help, who didn't, hmm. you know, so... It all went against me. I was mm-hmm. kind of an idiot out there. So, by the way, we, uh, we're we up here. I'm picking up my boat. It's a Nitro Z21 XL. Did something a little different this year because I felt like I had to. I'm mm-hmm. running two live transducers up front because I feel like I have to in order to compete. Out of 100 Bassmaster Elite Series guys, if I don't want my name down at that bottom 20% and I want it up at that top 20%, I feel like as a professional angler, I have to have these tools on my boat. 
Do you have forward-facing sonar? No. You don't? Are you kidding me? <laughs> have you ever had it on your boat? No, I've never had it. Never I had fished it. with Johnny Schultz with his before, uh -huh. so yeah. I've, I've seen it work, and I understand how it works. Yeah. What does he think about your opinion? Because isn't he like a guru, and that's like how he makes his business? Well, the is... thing about Johnny, it's like he... Johnny is like, okay, you know those kids that like are 12 years old and graduate college? Yeah. Geniuses? Yeah, oh, That's yeah. Johnny That's Schultz. Wow. He he knew more at eight years old about bass fishing than most people do now. And Johnny he, helps you with your YouTube channel, helped you. Did. He got me started on Sorry, everything. okay. Yeah. And okay. so Johnny Johnny could do as well as he does with anything with just 2D sonar because yep. he's a master, master at using it. So he doesn't, he's not all in on sports facing sonar because he uses other technology as well sure. with that. Interesting. So, <clears throat> Sorry, I was just wondering. I didn't know if you ever but, had it or not. You no. know, I didn't know if you like tested it out and in then fact, was like. I think I am. I'm on the verge of like getting all in and taking my electronics off and putting two flashers on. No kidding. And just that'd be awesome. Two Hummingbird Super Sixties because I could do, the way that I fish. I could still do as sure. good with that. Sure. You, of, you seem to fish shallow because I remember any open that we would bump in and be in the same area. I feel like you were always a little closer to the bank. Yeah, and I yeah was, you're a power guy. I yeah. mean, I've won almost $2 million fishing between bass, FLW, and stuff around here. And I have never caught a fish or made a penny off of anything except a flasher and 2D sonar. Oh, I've never man. caught a fish off of down imaging, side imaging, forward facing sonar. That's or impressive. Nothing. Are and you that, kidding so, me? Yeah, so you can do that. But were, were you ever against the other technologies when they came out? I was. I started feeling weird about side imaging because the first time I had side imaging, Aaron Martin's got it. And Aaron, Aaron and I went down to Grand Lake together and he was showing me how to use it. And it's like, I first saw it, it's like, man, this is just, <laughs> this does not seem quite right. But I mean, it's still not the same as forward facing sonar. Not it's not live. But you know what would be great is like, if, I mean, as high profile as you are in the sport, if you would come out and if you would dig into, I mean, you're a big swim bait expert. That's your deal. That's mm -hmm. your strength. If you would dig in and say, man, I, I'm just totally against this forward facing sonar. Look, we got to make we, money, Randy. I think I want to see Greg Hackney <laughs> no. flipping a one ounce jig with totally. 15 pound braid. I want to see Chris Aldane yep. on an eight inch swim bait. I want to see Dean Rojas throwing a frog. Yep. And that's where we need to get back to. You've got yeah. enough pull in the industry to help make that I, happen. I know? think <laughs> if it really is a problem, that it will come out through live if people really do get bored. But um, I do not recommend him taking your advice oh, because we got to, he's well, got to yeah, make the I classic know, you, next yeah. year you can't compete without it i no, understand that it's yeah. i mean it sucked it's a spot but like, i, I, I do think that the people will speak right yeah. I, I really truly do think that if the product that we start putting out there the organization starts putting out there becomes something that is unbearable who thinks to social media it, there will be no one who can stand up and say okay, this is good for us. But I think we're already there. I just think they're ignoring the reality of the situation. I think the vocal minority is so loud on this mm -hmm. yeah. that it drowns out the majority of the people out there. But and, again, going back to we don't need to rush to this decision, like I think about just a bigger picture, the government. I don't want the government rushing to a decision and making a law that takes away something that shouldn't have been taken away. So I've, I'm always... When it comes to regulation, I never want us to rush. Well, did you guys see what the PGA did with the golf ball deal last week? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. They, 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 PGA announced last last week that they are rolling back their their uh, uh, as far as their specs on golf balls because the golf ball manufacturers had created this technology to increase the drive length by like ten or fifteen oh, percent. Yeah. Wow! That's and they said this is not what. The, you know, pro golf is about, we're taking it back. We're going to go back to the specs of like 10 years ago. Right. And this is our baseline. Wow. That's the same thing that bass fishing can do with electronics. Wow. Right. They recognize the importance of tradition to some extent. Every sport has, yeah. every single sport yeah. has, except for bass fishing. And I, I just go back to, again, it's like, if I, if I went to Chase Anderson said, Ch Chase, intuitive angling, I'm going to, here's, I'm going to sign a contract. I'm going to give you $3 million a year for the next 10 years. Um, not have it. You guys, everybody's going to run 2D sonar and that's it. You'd be running 2D sonar next yeah, year. Yeah, absolutely. Big that's the reality that of is, the situation. It, is. it really is. What's funny, what you say is um, when Humpingbird bought the, you know, the, for the live, 
the exclusive live. The I always, live, yeah. I always told people like because their their live technology is way behind. It's not a secret. And I always said they should have paid past to not allow <laughs> live technology or allow to show it. Like that's that would have been my marketing we'll, move. We'll be you getting know? an email tomorrow on that comment. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, what do you guys think about? The, and I get this a ton from my subscribers. It's like there needs to be two circuits, a non-live scope, you know, and a live scope circuit. I mean, is that, is that just no, too It's a little chaotic too, and confusing yeah, to me. I, yeah, I, I would like to be it. either you have it or you don't type of thing. When they... I just want regulations. The, to, yeah, uh, I had a batch representative. If, you, if, you, if, you, if, if the Elite Series said just theoretically you're going to do that... What would you do? Non non live scope or live scope? I'm a non live scope guy. I think most. But guys like I would. said, the boat I'm running next year is like rigged to the nine, like just like just. And here's the crazy thing. But- people would not kill him because he didn't do well. Well, he didn't have his boat. You know, Rick. He's always been very good with his electronics. It's not like he's I one, love it. I mean, one yeah. of the guys who can't use electronics. Like saying that is like a stu- when people say that in the comment section, I'm like that's one of the dumbest arguments you can make. He's fantastic with his electronics. He just hasn't been utilizing, you know, the live technology the latest, that's required. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's right. a difference, trust me. If you look closely, I'm not going to say names, look closely at some of the results these last few smallmouth tournaments, you'll see guys from Louisiana with oh, yeah. the greatest live scope are beating these smallmouth experts. You mm-hmm. talked on this on one of your on one of your videos, but um it yeah, it's super, super interesting um to see there. Um but yeah, when you know, just uh three months ago when um you know this angler survey where a bass representative came to myself and I think five other dudes, six other dudes, something like that, uh who have been in it for a while and asked their opinion, um, you know, do we need to completely get rid of it? Do we need to do nothing, leave it as it is, or some kind of compromise in the middle? And I honestly said, my I'm going to put my uh, my vote in as take just take some type of step, whether it's a small step in, you know, uh, reducing it down to only one transducer. It's still the technology, yes, I know, uh, but my vote was submitted and said, hey, look, just something, mm-hmm. or at least let us know you're working on something, you know. And um, yeah, I do have concerns, the same concerns that that you have, but. Again, the way the arena we are playing in right now, it's like you were way behind. It's literally leaving money on the table if if yeah. you're not equipped. I, and, and it's sad. It's I mean, it's it is, and and I ha- I have never faulted or attacked any professional angler for using it because I understand you have to do it. Yeah. I yeah, I've been hard as as hell on the tournament organizations yeah. about it because they're the ultimately ones they're that are the forcing ones. you guys into it. Yeah. yeah, and that's that's a it's a. Uh, it's an unusual reality we find ourselves in and proficient. It's so different. It's like, yeah. I, unless you've been in it as long as like you, you've been in a long time too. 13 years now. Yeah. I mean, people don't understand the metamorphosis that has taken place just, just like in what them. tournament fishing is. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just like, I can't believe it. I, and I don't understand why a lot of the older guys haven't been more, more vocal about it. I think they're pretty vocal. I think old Matt Heron's been real vocal about it. Yeah. You know? And they, they should be because you guys, you got guys like Matt Heron that is a hammer and all of the skills that he has developed over mm-hmm. the decades are worthless now. Yeah. Yeah. He I'll, can't compete Just about with worthless. Yeah. When he, right. uh, a good, he brought up two points. We were um, at the St. Lawrence and it was right after Champlain and one of his was, that he absolutely smashed the large mouth. On, I think it was large mouth on Champlain, but like the weight he brought in in any tournament before forward facing sonar became a thing would have been like top three, legit. top five. Yeah, and he I don't even think he made a check. Yeah, and he was like, "How how does that like happen?" Eighteen pounds a day or something. Yeah, like. and then he brought up the one, and he and this one got me thinking: How does an eighteen year old step in to the the pro circuits and just start competing. He like, says he said eighteen year old snot nosed kid before. <laughs> that's what he said. And he said like me. since when is that with zero experience real, yeah, you know, I that mean, you can compete with the best yeah. of the best. And yeah. and and I that did that cause sometimes and I love you, Matt. Don't get mad at me, but sometimes I think he's you're crazy sometimes. <laughs> it's okay. I'm crazy too. Some of his points I'm always like, oh my gosh. But that one kind of stopped me in my tracks, and I was like, I never thought about it that way. You know, if you can compete in something that has always required lots of experience on the water experience and in a, a level of intuition that you're almost just born with, 
and and you now don't need either of those. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. So well, that's that, um, Micah Frazier uh, recently announced his retirement. He's kind of a you know younger to middle aged guy who uh, chose to spend more time with his family and businesses uh, other than make a living fishing. He made a comment saying, you know, uh, yes, I'm going to spend time with my family. I'm going to be here for them. And I simply don't like the direction fishing is going. In your opinion, when you hear something like that, what is he referring to? The direction. He doesn't like the direction fishing is going. And by the way, a very high-profile angler that recently retired alluded to the same thing mentioned the same thing yeah i think it's a lot of things i think it's the technology i think it's the fact that tournament fishing has become a money pit anymore and you cannot make a living at it like you could back you know 20 years ago just off of sponsorships and winnings because back then the entries were lower payouts were higher sponsorship opportunities were more competition was less Less. to get those sponsorship dollars on the both the endemic and non-endemic side You don't have that now. It's like the competition for sponsorships and for tournaments. Everybody's good. There's no, there's no no daylight. I'll make the case. And I've fished around these guys forever. You guys, if you, if you had a tournament at Tabor Rock Lake tomorrow, I don't care if you had an elite series tournament or a Bass Pro Tour tournament or a BFL, the BFL is going to take the same weight to win all three of those tournaments. It's going to take the same weight to, to get a check. You're right. And so the skill level between professional anglers today is there's no, there's no daylight. There's no tears. tears. It's all, yeah. There's dudes out here that fish Tabor Rock Lake on these local tours. They would be superstars in the sport, but they just chose not to fish it. So, you know, from that standpoint, that, that is what separates pro fishing from other sports out there is the talent level. There's, there's just not that separation. And that's what's one of the things that's frustrating. He's probably th- talking about there. It's just so hard to make it now. There's yeah. too many tournaments, too many anglers out there. Not enough money. Not enough money. It's like the pie you, smaller. Do you think that uh, tournament fishing needs to go down to one organization with tiers? Or how is there a solution that's even possible the, at this to, point? You know, like I said, I've been in it forever. And the, the best scenario that I ever saw is back when we had – just the Bassmaster circuit, the Bassmaster Top 100s. Um, there was a clear-cut path to the classic. No bones about it with that. Then you had like uh, BF or the, or I guess it was Redman back then. They had the uh, BFL circuit, the Redman Tour. You had the Weekend Circuit. That is like boom, boom, boom. Yeah, yeah, that that to me that was like the best period in pro fishing. What was the entry fee in the one the one hundreds? Is that what you said? When I my first year on the circuit, when I started, all they had was six Bassmaster Invitationals. They took the top thirty five to the classic, six hundred dollars per entry, six hundred dollars per tournament. What was the payout? The it was they usually gave a boat for first prize and maybe like five thousand dollars, and they gave a boat for big bass too, which was which is nice. And then when we had the top one hundred circuit which lasted up until the early nineties, those entries were like, I think a thousand or thousand mm-hmm. dollars. And then it incrementally started coming up there a little bit. But the the thing about it is like, if you made the classic, like the first four or five classics I made, you could go to ICAST and you could get all type of like, you know, three to $500 a month lure deals and stuff like that. You can't right. do that anymore. Well, but, what? but also, you, you know, going back to how we started this podcast, right. Um, you're getting 1.5 million views a month. So if to, in order for us to, to not have, uh, or to go back to that model, we couldn't have the media we have today, Mm -hmm. but if we didn't have the media we had today, you wouldn't be getting one and a half million views. So it's like the evolution, Mm -hmm. you know, but how do we evolve on the tournament side to protect the guys who are at the top where they can still make a living where that means something. It, it's so weird. What uh, yeah. you know at at our level, the biggest complaint for professional bass fish professional bass fishermen is the payout suck. We pay fifty grand. Is it fifty grand entry fees? Forty eight thousand, yeah. whatever it is in entry fees. But our payouts suck. Is what is what these anglers are claiming. In your opinion, with all the wisdom and all the the knowledge you have over decades of fishing, what would it take for our entry fees? Well. MLF tried it. What would it take for, let's just say, our payouts to increase substantially? What would it take? 
Well, I think that right now you need to have a situation where if you get 50 a place in the tournament, you know, you're making 15 or $20,000. We had a period of a four year, five year period on FLW where they paid $20,000 down to 20th place in three of the six tournaments. They called them the opens there. Yeah. So payouts, uh, payouts were a lot better. Go ahead. How do you financially do that, though? I feel like we would bankrupt our organization. Well, they, like, yeah, they, they, at the time, they they were paying back 140% because they had the Walmart vendors Backing, right. taking care of it with that. And um, that's what's changed now. We just, you know, we're just we not even fishing for 100% payout now. Yeah. What, what do you, and, why don't we have that support anymore? What went wrong where Walmart wants nothing to do with bass fishing? I, well, the, the vendors, they basically had their arms twisted to begin with by Erwin Jacobs to be part of that program. The Procter & Gamble. Said. Well, Erwin was friends with, the, with a, God, I can't remember his name now, the president of Walmart at the time. And it was sort of like a, you know, who you know type thing. Got it. Got that. But there was a period of there, like during from about 99 to 2000, like in my own situation, you know, I was making probably, you know, 150,000 a year from sponsorships. Nice. And then whatever your winnings, you know, if I won a tournament, it'd be, you'd have another hundred something thousand. Your entry fees were being paid for. So you could legitimately, you know, have some big windfall profits there. Those days are gone. You can, you cannot make those type of windfall profits. And because there's 1% of the people that have those six figure sponsorships and not have any expenses to go with it. And whatever that little magical five or six year window, we, we, yeah. we pass that by. It's never going to come back there again. Do you think, uh, the organizations like Bass need to somehow create a better product to sell to another Walmart or sell to another non-endemic sponsor? You think we need to, is that where it starts is like creating a niche. better, pro- well, that's what I'm We're asking. Too niche. Yeah. Is you know? that even possible to create a better product or experience for, you know, Ford trucks or Toyota trucks or whatever to invest in that product? I mean, is that, I mean, is, is that possible or does it start with, uh, you know, or does it start the other way around where we don't, I don't think we have a product that gets the eyeballs and moves the needle at this point. That, that's, you said it perfect there because yep. that's, that's where I was going with they, that. They've tried everything. They've tried to build stars within the sport. Yes. That didn't work really. You know, they've tried to make it more of a spectator friendly sport. That really didn't work. I mean, our sport is what it is. Yep. I Tournament mean, we, bass yep. fishing. Yeah. Yep. Well, I mean, we simply don't have the appeal like other sports do out there. So you have to operate within that. Yeah. And the problem that we get into now is, like I said, there's so many people that are attracted to it and want it. The pie has just been cut down so many times that it makes it tough for everybody. And that's why I always talk in my videos about how this is truly becoming an elitist sport at the top level. Because unless you have some type of outside income or, you know, whatever it allows you to do, it, you simply cannot stay in it, let alone just pay your bills at home, pay your mortgage payment. I'm just talking about fishing. Yeah, That's in, where your opinion, in your opinion, um, I know the anglers don't really talk money and finances and things. Out of 100 uh, professional bass anglers, let's just say the Elite Series, say $50,000 in entry fees. In your opinion, how many of the 100 anglers um, are earning uh, their entry fees in sponsorship money. So earning $50,000 in sponsorship in this day and age, in your opinion. On the elite series? On the elite, what percentage of guys? God, I would, I mean, if if it's not, you know, 25, 30%, I'd be shocked. I'd yeah. have to be at state would be that range I there. I agree. I mean, That's what? crazy. I agree. Yeah. Uh, right? I mean, would you agree with that? I, I would agree that there's your halves, and that's not a lot. Yeah. And there's a lot of have nots, especially with where the economy's going right now. I would, man, it's a tough call. Yeah. But yeah, it's pretty bad, you know, unfortunately. How I many do you I, think are making over 100000 in in uh in Profit. Spon- no, earning, in profit. Yeah. I, I think six-figure sponsorship portfolios with pros now are very rare. Very rare. It, it's just the upper echelon yep. of pros. And, 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 15% maybe? Oh, no, no. Not and, on the elites. We don't have enough. Um, yeah, fifteen percent, twelve percent. So you're if you say ten percent, you're saying that there are ten, 10 guys who make over a hundred thousand figures, and so maybe yeah. Yeah, and that's just and that's only because that they have outside you know 
you know, gigs out there that doesn't have anything to do with tournament fishing. If you're rougher, Correct, on, right? If you're rougher on the edges, you can't sit, you can't make it like that. So you don't think but, uh, endemically anyone's there are many that are pulling six figures no, directly from no. the fishing I, and industry. And in the past, yeah. I think there was because in the past there was a lot more lucrative boat deals. I think the lucrative boat deals Big that are deal. out there now are few and far between. Yeah. They still exist. There's you know, but it's not like it was. 25 or 30 years ago where there were a lot of guys getting no 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 charge boats yeah I mean, and two or three of them i, I heard that, some guys uh, were getting two boats three boats there's still some guys who do get two but i'd say that when you saw that mlf split i i this is what i've always said is that the vets because they can stay in the they can stay fishing for so long they start to hog up those upper echelon deals and boat deals well they're worth it well some of them are worth it whatever <laughs> so, and, and so it's hard to, when the younger guys start performing to give them those deals because the budget's so top heavy with the, the veterans who have proved themselves, whether they're still catching them then. And then when that split happens, we saw all of a sudden there were some boat deals to get because some guys lost their boat deals because they went places they weren't, yeah they, they, they weren't supported and going, hmm. but that's, that's what opened my eyes to, okay, there still are those boat deals. Yeah. Well, let me, I'll give you guys a prime example back. There was about a four year period when I was talking about where, when I was with Mercury, I got two free motors a year mm -hmm. and I got two to sell at 50% off. Gosh, that's good. So, four motors total. Yeah. I got four, two to sell at 50% off and two free ones, 200 horsepowers. Those deals don't exist anymore. And the reason is because everybody has to have a motor. There's only yeah. a couple of companies. Back then it did. Those motor companies were fighting for the high profile pros out there. They don't have to do that anymore. No. So yeah. those right. those deals of those sweet endemic deals are done yeah. unless it's your, you know, you got some type of royalty deal with a big company. Yeah. So then and do you go back to thinking there needs to be one league? I always I think there should be one league. I think Bassmaster is the deal. Bassmaster mm -hmm. has got the tradition. The sport started with it. They got the Bassmaster Classic. I think everything that has come along, including FLW, even even some of the positives that FLW did in the long term, it devaluated the sport. Right. It did. If I we agree. if Bassmaster would have maintained the sole undisputed um, benchmark of what a professional angler was, yeah. we would be a lot closer to the PGA or the NFL or yeah. whatever. I agree. It but dilutes what pro it means. It totally diluted yeah. it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as, for as much as FLW did to bring non-endemics into the sport, yeah. in the bigger picture, it really hurt us big time. And I know a lot of it is like, you know, I knew Ray Scott pretty good, you know, and he, he was a master at what he did up there, but he... I mean, he he had other agendas besides, you know, what we're talking about here. And it's like, back to Trade's point, starting the the, the uh, podcast, it's like nobody has really emerged to become that true leader in the sport that yeah. had the, that had it, they, uh, that had some type of a higher vision beyond vision. just generating sure. profit that had, that truly had some type of a interest in the sport on the long term. Closest we ever had to it was Jerry McInnes. Yeah. I mean, Jerry and I were super close friends. I ha I had tons of conversations with him one on one personally. He truly had the best interest of the sport in within his heart. that era at yeah. that time, right? But but, but, but he had a, a lot of people would say a lot of his anglers would say at least towards the la latter half that he also was looking out for just Jerry. That's what they would say. Yeah, he well he had there was a lot of outside influences that did not allow him to see his vision manifested. Right is what would it have? It's just. But no, nobody has taken that role on that lead that we've had out there. But yeah, to, back to your question. I mean, this if we if Bassmaster was the only, pro, it's like you are you cannot call yourself a pro unless you're on, on the, the Bassmaster leads. upper level, the Bassmaster tour. Yeah, that is it. It's just like you, you know, if you're an NFL football player, you're not a pro football player unless you're in the NFL. Right. What's your opinion on um, like angler associations or? Um, were you ever a part of the PAA and what? Mm -hmm. Yeah, unionizing. Yes, yes. I'll tell you guys a story. We were at the Bassmaster Classic. God, when was it? It was was it James River. It may have been. It's either James River or Logan Martin. The day before the tournament, this was back when the whole we were trying to get organized like a union. All the pros were, and we we were you know fed up with the low payouts. We wanted right. higher payouts. 
Sounds so we had a meeting the day before the classic. We got all the pros together with Ray Scott and we had a list of demands. We wanted, I can't remember what the, the day demand. before a classic. Day before the no classic. That's kidding. a perfect time yeah. to Heck do it. Yeah, it is. <laughs> we got him in there um, and you know, talked about the demands, basically increasing our payouts and that type of stuff. Ray got pissed. He goes, I'll tell you guys what. He goes, You don't want to fish this classic tomorrow? I'll get on the phone and I'll have 35 guys down here tomorrow that'll fish it. Savage. Make your decision. Wow. And when you have that type of non-negotiable stance right. how are you ever going <laughs> to make any head road with that what wow. happened what did happen to the paa what ultimately imploded that thing it was just angler apathy and the fact that back then like angler leadership or just all the it anglers? was both it was just pe- one of the problems with pro- with pro anglers organizing back then is everybody was so interested in maintaining their own position and their own careers they didn't have the time or energy to put in the bigger picture and most anglers did not want to make waves especially back then it's like you were not allowed to make waves with sponsors or the tournament organizations that is one of the good things about now is that sponsors are a lot more you know open-minded and free about that but it wasn't like that back then it's like you tow the line if you get out of line you're out of here you're out there was no social media to put it on blast no that that's the way it was and it was it was a tough time with that it was very frustrating you think it's possible to uh, to create an anglers association now where there's you know there's no outside influence or outside sponsorships we're really (laughs) Is it possible for anglers to band, professional anglers to band together and and demand more from the organizations? I mean, yeah, I think that's that is possible, but again, you, you can't get you can't get people motivated enough to get on board together. With and it's got to be ten out of ten he, guys, yeah, or hundred out of a hundred. They've got their lives to lead. They got other interests with that. Old they're, feet. They're yeah. not going to make that commitment. It'll never happen. I don't the, think. The only way the sport is ever going to get to that point is, and, and in a perfect scenario, is you've got some dude that's like mega wealthy that loves fishing. He's loaded. He loves fishing. He goes, "I'm going to change the sport." He goes, "We're going to." Create the sport. It, we're, the anglers are going to own it. The anglers are going to be control of it. Nobody is going to be greedy. Nobody is going to be in this for profit. And we're going to do what's best for the sport. But it sounds nobody, like a meeting I walked into like in the end of 2018. It sounds just like it. And that that it's it's a great idea, but it didn't pan out. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> well, and it's not even that it's an idea. Like people like to say that, but then the, deep down they have their own ulterior motives to you know they're using the right words of course. but they're they're wanting to form that to get what we they were, want hey, a lot of anglers were sold know? on that very idea right there but execution was not not there yeah it's i mean i you know me being a dinosaur in the sport you know i've seen it during its good times and bad times and unless you were really there and you could you could feel what that energy was like at yeah. certain times of it it's hard to it's hard to relay that to people you know, that haven't been in it as long. I mean, even though you guys have been in it for quite a while, you still, it it wasn't, you know, like 30 years ago. Um, How old is Elijah now? Elijah's your boy, right? Yeah, he turned six in June. Six, and then you have a 11 and a 12? Yeah, Kim, uh, Elijah and I are Kim's together, and we have uh, Elliot and Owen. They're with us from Kim's first marriage. They split time with their dad and us. So Elliot, Owen, or Elijah comes up to you in, let's say, you know, five to eight years Dad, I want to become a professional bass fisherman. What do you say? I would totally steer him away from it. Yeah. And I, that's one thing. I don't try to push it on him now to fish and anything. Pro fishing is a hard way to make a living. You guys know better than anybody yeah. out there. And you guys are real fortunate because you travel together and you yeah. work together as a team. But when you when you have, you know, when you have to be away from your family and your kids out there, man, it is a tough thing to do. Yeah. And, not not just that, but just your family and your friends. I mean, I all the time I spent away from my parents for thirty years on the road traveling. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a, a lot. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize the sacrifice that it takes. Man, it's it's a tough way to make a living. It's a very stressful way to make a living too, especially you know if, if the financial end of it weighs on you, which it does for most people. That's why I've always felt that some of the anglers out there that did not have any financial distractions, yeah, how so. precious that would be to be able to focus 100% on fishing because most people don't have that luxury. You know? yeah. if, if you didn't have Bridgeford, did, do you think that you would be able to keep plugging along? Like like now? Yeah. Well, well, yeah. well now YouTube that, stepped in, but for many of the years. Like well, if you no, when I first got into it, because before YouTube, I had... Um, 
that in 2011, I had just, I had just lost my title sponsor like two weeks or two, three, two or three weeks before the season. And I did an article with Bassmaster or Bass Fan was talking about how well, I'm not really sure what I'm going to do, you know. And then the owner Bridgeford called me out of the blue and said, "Man, I've been watching you forever. Let's talk." So, wow, been that way forever. What's his name again? I've Al Bridgeford. Al, Al, that's right. Yeah, yeah Al. Cool I like dude. Al. I see him out at the U.S. Open. So yeah, we go travel you met west. Him out there? Yeah, yeah, he's cool. He's, he's a he's cool got dude. Two Rangers. He fishes a lot. Your deep career goes goes years and years and years. Uh, what's the biggest mistake you've made over the years? Not taking my Elite Series invitation in oh. 2004, Oof. by far. Oof. I got totally, well, I mean, that was the deal. You got to remember with the, with the whole Bush beer, Bass Master. Oh, yeah. No, I, no. I don't well, know. they had, yeah. back then, Bush was the title sponsor of Bass. And when we got, when I got my invitation to fish it, they said, well, you got to have a Bush beer sticker on your boat as part of the Elite Series thing. And oh, my, wow. my, my Fuji film contract Said I couldn't advertise alcohol, alcohol, tobacco, and I couldn't afford to lose a six figure sponsorship. Film. Yeah. So I had no choice but to stay with FLW. And of course, the very next year, FLW went down the tubes. Oh, no. And, and then Jerry McKinnis was super pissed about it because, you know, he was, we were close and he was wanting me over there, but I couldn't do it. I, I simply couldn't have afforded to do it. Lose that sponsorship. Yeah. And that was the worst decision in my life wow. by far. Wow. So it's uh, a lot of well, a lot of people got were in that same position. I think Clark Winlow was in the same position. Scott Martin, maybe. Um, God, there were several of them. I can't remember. Who That's some of that was. those politics we talked about Hedden's behind the scenes. Back yep. then, they were in the same boat with it. What's the biggest mistake you've made in the past decade? Past decade? Yeah. Well, let's see. Past no, past five. Not years. decade. Five, Sue, five years. Five years. Decade. Current. Yeah. Past Sue five years. years. Man. You made some good moves. Yeah, that, um, I can't think of anything that I really regret with that in there. I've just, one of the things I really enjoyed is not having to travel as much. You know, I'm fishing the Trode Series tournaments and the BFLs, so it still gives me a chance to have some content creation yeah. and still do promotions for my sponsors, but I can stay at home every night. All the tournaments, I can drive back and forth from the house. So that is super nice to be able to do that and then to transition into the YouTube, which mm-hmm. is it's a creative outlet and something I can do from now on with that. How do you keep it going? How do you keep, you, you do three videos a day. I, I know that you sometimes repeat your subjects. <laughs> I don't keep up yeah. too much, but I keep mm-hmm. up enough. Like how, how do you envision this YouTube three videos a day, like keeping the steam here? Well, it's just, it's getting creative and it's expanding into every subtly and every nuance that you can get into. Plus, do you call you, it, do you admit you're clickbaity? You gotta be. Yeah. You got if you if you don't if you don't clickbait, you're you're not gonna get the views. I've experimented with it. I yeah. know you can't put up there how to fish a jerk bait in December. Nobody will watch it. Right. You know? it's That's true. That is the reality of the situation. So what's the alternative? How do you turn uh you know, catching a jerk bait fish in December or how how to catch a jerk bait fish in December? Like right off the top of your head, what would you come up with? It's like in order something to get it's like it's like you can't believe how good this color pattern works there you in go. December. Or yep. you have you have to figure out something to get the that makes them yeah, the people in there. And that's that's the biggest it's that's the most difficult part of the video is coming up with a title of that. Does but, it weigh on you? Do you feel like maybe you're like not, not really, as often? The main the main thing it's all about putting the content out there because if I if I do a video on you know a pro blue mega bass jerk bait and I repeat it twice in one year I may have fifteen thousand people on the channel that weren't there before that have never seen it sure so there's enough of an audience to repeat something sure. like that or slightly tweak it well, a little bit make it interesting no I mean like the when you when you use a clickbait title do you feel like you're not as authentic because you're basically lying to get viewers. Yeah. Like, does that weigh on you at yeah. all? Yeah, it is. That yeah. but that is the reality of the situation. I don't like to do it. I would much rather just be bland and yeah. put it out there in front. But yeah. the reality of the YouTube, if you don't have the right thumbnail, if you don't have the right title that goes with it, you're you're just, you know, your views are going to be reduced by 50%, yep. at least on there. Yep. And then, but at the same time, people get aware of that a little bit. So then it even becomes more challenging. So you have to constantly think about new keywords, you know, new phrases, new way to put it together. And you don't know what, what really clicks because one of my most popular videos, I did one on swim bait modifications, mm-hmm. like on a rib swim bait. Mm-hmm. And it got something like 800,000 views. Wow. 
and I've tried to reduplicate that, and you it's can. like nobody wants to watch it. And yeah. that, so there's something about the algorithm YouTube picks up on how successful something is, like the first 24 hours, and they can and promote it, keeps, it. Yeah, right. And there's so much of it still that I don't understand. Are you enjoying? Are you enjoying the YouTube stuff? I love it love because it? it's yeah. a way. It's a like I said, it's a way to art form teach. It's an art form. It's you know, I, I just I like doing it. It's, it's I like being able to educate and you know teach people to to fish. Like I said, a lot of people don't. You know, some people use it, some people don't. Some people criticize it. Some people think it's great. But is having a YouTube channel a must-have in this day and age for a professional bass fisherman to Absol- excel? Absolutely, bare I mean, minimum, right? Yeah, I don't. As far as the interactions I have with with sponsors and the and the and the offers that I get you know, that come to me all the time as far as for advertising, I don't see how anybody cannot at least have just a modest YouTube channel, yeah. some type of a promotional avenue. Cause I don't know any sponsor out there that has not put more value into that than any other thing they can do. It's just like Hank Cherry went in two classics. I pretty much forgot about that, you know? Yeah, that's true. Good but, point. Yeah. But then again, I will see some little YouTuber that's never fished a tournament. Mm-hmm. And I see his name all the time. On it. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. So, it is crazy. Yeah, from that standpoint, it's things are we're in a we're in a different time and place today. Um, Got to adapt. Yeah. Great, you got anything else? I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. Well, yeah, we appreciate your time, Charles. How long have we gone over? He's a thumbnail god, by the way. He's probably gonna he's gonna make you look all buff. He's been spending time in the gym, but this one he's gonna buff you up a little bit. How much time? We wow, that's pretty good. Well, we appreciate your time. We got some other stuff scheduled today. I think we're going to do some fly fishing out cool. on gonna the river it. here. Yeah, it'd be cool. Pulling some big streamers. Gonna we're going to do on on here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'll yeah. So good. that'll be fun. But uh, there, I tell you, there are giant bass in there that they catch we on heard. big swim baits. We heard. We heard. I heard. Yeah. It's the time to do it right now. Yeah. Too. A little bit of grass in here too. Yeah, and that's kind of that's kind of hard to or hard to find in the in the Go on the lower end of the lake down there. That's right. Damn. That's right. They catch some big ones down there. That's right. Well, again, thank you for sitting down with us. We know you're full of wisdom. So as we part ways here, can you give our viewers um, advice, life advice, fishing advice, uh, being a good human being advice, dad advice, whatever it is, give us good advice. I, I think the, the whole thing is just, I mean, people just need to be kind to each other. Mm-hmm. I mean, one of the things that I have learned about this whole YouTube is I've made a lot of friends on it. You know, and I've alienated a lot of people at it, but ultimately everybody can respond and relate to being kind. Yep. Even if you don't agree with somebody, sure. just like what Trey was saying. Conversation, sure. You, know, you can have a respectful, civil conversation and get along with anybody. It's just like I can fish with somebody that's completely di- polar op- polar opposite than me politically or philosophically, but you get them in the boat and it just neutralizes that. So it it's like if everybody was just better to each other would be a better world of thing i think everything yeah the fishing world everything the yeah. internet would be a better place yeah. the whole world would be a better place that's good advice well randy block thank you so much we'd love to go round two with you as we uh hey maybe forward facing sonar will develop into live 360 technology <laughs> with underwater camera stuff and then we could hop back up on a <laughs> podcast and well, uh, I talk hear, about I hear that the virtual go- reality it's coming. goggles is coming i so bet you know, they, Oof. <laughs> see that how yeah. that works out we i cannot wait Woo. ai or something you know yeah all right well we'll talk about it then on the next one randy thank you so yeah, much thanks guys Appreciate and it. uh keep up the good work thank, thank you, you.